Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are our hope and trust. Open up our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts, both now and throughout the worship service and the service tonight. We pray that you would be here with us, that you would, through your spirit, illumine our minds and our hearts and help us to take heed to what we hear, to what we read, and we pray that we would put it into practice. We pray that you would bless us, that we might bring honor and glory to you and be faithful and fruitful in living the Christian life as your children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're continuing in our series on hope. Uh, next week, uh, you'll have a substitute teacher. Joe McGuire will be here. I'm not sure what he's going to teach on. And then I'll be back the following Sunday. Uh, we'll be away on vacation. Um, so by way of review, uh, last week we focused on prayer. I had thought we were going to get through prayer, but you get a little more of that today as we did not quite finish. But we focused on prayer. Uh, Paul calls us in another book that we didn't look at to pray without ceasing or to always be in a state of communion with God, of communication with God, where we recognize our great neediness and his great sufficiency to provide. Uh, we learned some things we should regularly pray for and for ourselves and for one another. Uh, and we like, for instance, praying increasingly to have by the power of God working in us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, to have the eyes of our hearts enlightened and illumined so that we understand the truths of the scripture, how great God is, how great our need is, and the things that he's called us to do, as well as the substance and the richness of that hope that we just sang about. We need to take time to go through those hymns slowly on our own, I think, and feast on those words. These so many hymns are so rich in meaning and you really, we sing them, but then we have to go, do I really know this? Do I really believe this? Do I really do this? Just like we have to do with the scriptures. So um, I encourage you in that regard. And also to grasp the riches of the inheritance that we sang about it as well. The inheritance that is ours through Christ as, as we are co-heirs with him. The call to us, God's purpose for us, is that we would become increasingly holy and blameless. The call is to absolute holiness and absolute blamelessness, which we will never achieve in this life. But our goal is to increase incrementally through life. And we talked about illumination. Uh, and here's a quote that I gave you. Illumination is dependent on the spiritual enlightenment that assimilates divine truth. So the heart may have sounder perceptions than the head. That was from F.F. F. Bruce in his commentary on Ephesians. Based on what Christ has accomplished on our behalf and dressed in the robes of righteousness provided to us, we have that boldness of confidence that we sang about in the first hymn to come before the Lord in prayer. And uh, a stanza from a hymn that John identified for us last week. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. But again, all our prayers should be with the idea of, God, your will be done, not mine. Always with that in mind. So uh, we will turn <clears throat> to where we didn't get to uh, last week, which was Ephesians chapter 3. We looked at the prayer in Ephesians 1. Now we're going to look at the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. And let me... Um, because of the unsearchable riches of God's grace that uh, have been revealed by God and through Paul and through others and contained within the scripture, Paul prays in this manner uh, for the Ephesians and for us and as an example of how the kinds of things we should be praying for. For this reason, which points us back to what he's already said in uh, the beginning of chapter three, um, in terms of 
the mysteries of Christ that have been made known. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, and by the way, be thinking about what he's praying for, because we're going to put it on the board, and I'm going to depend upon you to give me those. Uh, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that... Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So, tell me, what is he? what did he pray for, and what... Therefore, should we be praying for for ourselves and others? Strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit. What else? That we may be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded. Not just experience. What else? Comprehend. What was that? Comprehend. Comprehend. And what is it? How is his love described? How large is it? Anybody? How fast is all knowledge? Yeah. It's infinite. Comprehend infinite love? Well, comprehend it as best we can with our, the limitations we have because of our sinful nature and our finite minds. But we need to understand that it is infinite. And it says how he gives four directions, if you will. Uh, and so it's beyond our ability to comprehend. And we need to remember how great it is, how large it is. Because, again, we need to have a big view of God, not a small view of God. And the larger our view of God, the larger our view of his love, the larger, the greater, our, the deeper our hope will be, our faith will be, our trust will be, and the less we'll worry. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what else? Christ may dwell in our hearts. What does that mean, John? All consuming thought in uh, our hearts being uh, our being, our, our feelings, our will. Uh, We're called to have the mind of Christ. Yeah. We're, taught, we're called to have our minds conform to the image of Christ, to be renewed, to be like Christ. Our representative the whole of the whole man. Exactly. And so the whole of our being is to be transformed to become more like Christ from grace to grace, from moment to moment, increasingly becoming more like Christ increasingly becoming more holy and blameless because he was perfectly holy and blameless. And we, our lives are hid with him in Christ. We have, we're co-heirs with him and we are to have the same mindset, the same perspective, the same attitudes, the same goals, the same desires, the same affections that Christ had more and yet more, because that is what we <laughs> will find most fulfilling and satisfying. And that is how we will be in heaven. And therefore, 
If that's what is most satisfying, fulfilling, et cetera, in heaven, we should desire to be as much like that, as much like we are positionally in Christ, and that we will be for all eternity now. Good. Anything else? Or we get it all? Know the love of God. Comprehend and know. It's getting too low on the board. You won't be able to see it. Let's add it there. Good. So, yes. My, my, this translation is interesting. It says, reach out and experience the breath. Test its length. Plumb its depth. Rise to the height. Live full life. Full of the fullness of God. In other words, get with it, people. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, out of curiosity, what translation is that? It's the message. The message. Okay. It's just a... Yeah. Easy to understand. Right. Okay. Right. Something that kind of like the Amplified Bible gives you some additional thoughts as to how rich it might be. And then we, we use uh, other translations maybe for our study. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so I want you to turn, you should have a Trinity hymnal near you. Uh, turn to the Shorter Catechism, to page 877. I am getting, oh, wait a minute, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, I am getting ahead of myself in one sense, but we're going to go ahead and do this now. Um, what does the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The preface of the Lord's Prayer, which is Our Father, which art in heaven, teaches teacheth us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence. That word confidence again. Holy reverence and confidence as children to a father, able and ready to help us, and that we should pray with and for others. We're to draw near with holy reverence and with confidence, with bold confidence, as we learned from Hebrews 4 last week. Uh, as we learn from the Lord's Prayer, which we will briefly look at, Lord willing, uh, we'll see if we get there um, today. But I just want you to have that in mind. We have a Heavenly Father who cares about us, who listens, who wants us to come, and we are to come and we are to pray big prayers for ourselves and for others. Because God is a big God, and God has big plans and is accomplishing big things. But these are, are things that you could be praying for yourselves and for others. And, you know, do we pray these kind of prayers very often is the question. If, if they are here in the scriptures, and Paul was praying them these kinds of things for the saints at that time, there are good things for us to pray for, for ourselves and for others. Um, and the kind of power we need, uh, this wasn't really up here. Well, strengthen us with power from the Holy Spirit, and we need that Holy Spirit to give us the power to comprehend, uh, so that we really understand the, we need that spiritual, that mental spiritual power and of understanding that the Holy Spirit can supply us with, and God is ready and willing to help us in that that regard, because the call is to try to comprehend the the impossible to comprehend the inf the infinitude of God in all His attributes, but in this case uh, to try to comprehend His infinite love by which we have been saved. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit's help so that we can grasp it as well as possible, and yeah, get to it, trying to understand, trying to grasp it as much as possible. Because as we are, are, as we understand that love and are impacted by the, the extent of that love that should cause us to grow in our adoration and in our praise and our gratitude and our rejoicing and our thanksgiving, and that will help us to be buoyed up in hope and help take us out of our anxiety and our despair that we are prone to fall into. Um, and we're called to, uh, to be like Christ, and 
to abound in love uh, and good deeds and to excel still more and that Christ may dwell in us and be seen through us. You know, that's what we want. We want people to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is God's call upon us, that people would see that hope, that trust, that they would see Christ in us as we love one another and as we love them. I want to take you to another book for a moment, Colossians chapter 2. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, verse 1, just to put it more context in it. Again, this is Paul writing. I want you to know how much I am struggling for, those, for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be, what? Encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. See, he he talks about this to lots of different people. That they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent uh, from you in the body, I am present with you in the spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Let me pause there for just a moment. He didn't want them to be deceived. He didn't want them to go off track. And in our current world situation, there are lots of pressures for us to oh, let's not be quite so firm on these things. Uh, you know, it's not really very well accepted by our everyone around us. And so we should just kind of you know, pull back from some of the absolute statements we make. No! There's, there are articles in uh, last month's table talk about this issue. Um, and... We have to not compromise on the truth, and we have to realize that there are lot, there's lots of deception, and lots of pressures upon us to compromise and to maybe question the veracity of things in here or whether they're as absolute as it says. They are. They are. And we must hold firm. Okay. Uh, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up. Oh, here it is again. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. See to it, again, he has here, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. Fullness. Christ will dwell in you. Um, fullness in Christ. Um, uh, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. Not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism on the cross and raised with him from the grave through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Just want to, and then uh, here is a, a quote from a Puritan preacher. Um, By walking with God, I mean a sincere endeavor to manage, conduct, and dispose all our words and deeds and whole conversation in reverence and fear with humility and singleness of heart as in the sight of an invisible God in uh, inutterable sweet communion and humble familiarity with his holy majesty in a word to live in heaven upon earth. That's a quote from Robert Bolton who lived uh, 1572 to 1631. Uh, When we, 
when we're back on the 16th, I'll have that uh, on the review sheet. I found this. This came via Inc. LinkedIn, uh, the C.S. Lewis Institute, uh, which I follow. Uh, I saw that quote after I'd already made the handout and sent it to Jeff. Uh, but I wanted to share that with you, and I'll share it again uh, in the review. Um, now, turning back to Colossians 3, uh, Philippians, uh, Ephesians 3, hello. Um, we come now to that beautiful, beautiful moving doxology in verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do what? Just a little more than we ask or imagine? A lot more? No, immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God can do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine. And again, going back to that, that hymn stanza, uh, large petitions. We, we should come with big prayers. You know, somebody who has been fighting God for, you know, 40 years. Oh, gosh, I, I guess I should just give up praying. No, don't. It took my brother 40 years to uh, come to the Lord. Um, pray big prayers and say, you know, God accomplish your will in your time, but this is what I this is what I hope for. But you know, God, you're in charge. But we should come with big prayers, with bold prayers, even when things seem, you know, that could that possibly happen? With God, all things are possible, right? We need to come with Him with bold prayers. Um, how does? Oh, I already answered the question. I was going to ask you to. Answer, how does God answer our prayers on our that we pray uh, for others? Um, he, uh, God, God, the sovereign and omnipotent one is able to do immeasurably more for our good and benefit than we can ask or imagine. He does so through his power that is at work within us, that dunamis power, that dynamite power, resurrection power within us to minister to the minister through the ministration of the holy spirit and it's all for his glory and again that should always be in the forefront of our minds when we think speak act pray will this be for god's glory wanting god's glory i know it's difficult okay uh let us move forward to something that's the opposite of hope to anxiety and anxiousness. First of all, hope, just to remind you, to cherish a desire with anticipation, to have confident expectation. And there's more to the definition of hope, but those are a couple of key things we've talked about. Anxiety, what is it? Apprehensiveness uneasiness or nervousness over an impending or anticipated ill, anxious, characterized by extreme uneasy, uneasiness of mind or brooding fear about some negative contingencies, mentally distressing concern or fear. Now, question for you all. What things cause people to be anxious? What are the sources of anxiety? Bottom line. She went with the bottom line answer. Okay, good. What else? Relationships. Well, go ahead. Relationships. Relationships, yes. Relationships can cause lots of anxiety. Illness. Illness, yes. Lori, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Finances. Finances, yes. What else? Conflict. Conflict. Oh, yeah. I mean, talk about yeah, <laughs> territory conflict. Yes, and and that that happens on an individual scale, or it can happen on a, a, a national scale. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, there's lots of anxiety in, in those from 
Ukraine because of what Russia is doing, for instance. That kind of anxiety. Anything else? Natural disasters. Natural disasters, yes. Earthquakes or tornadoes or the threat of, of a tornado or a hurricane coming. Yes, very good. Lack of trust. Lack of trust of God, yes. Very good. Unmet expectations. Yep. Unmet expectations. In the time, and especially in the time frame in which we wanted those expectations met. Uh, and we can, there are examples in the scriptures of that too. How long, God, before you act? We hear that in the Psalms on a number of occasions. Right? A uh, lack of control. Okay. Not having it. Yes. Yes, medical conditions of various types, or the, or even as you're waiting for the results of a test, when maybe you're fine, but you don't know yet, that bring can bring on lots of anxiety. Good. So there's. The uh, pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Weather. Yep. Um. Now. Uh. What is the most common two-word command in the scriptures? Bingo. Fear not. We're commanded to not fear. We're commanded to not be anxious, to not have anxiety. That's a command. A command that we find very difficult to obey. Um, our ability to fear not, like our ability to uh, have strong, confident hope, is tied to our view of God. Because the first answer was, you know, a lack of trust in God. And again, the bigger our view of God is, the deeper our understanding of the characteristics and the attributes of God, and understanding the infinitude of his love for us, of remembering his promise to never fail us, never forsake us, to always be with us, to walk with us through even the valley of the shadow of death. You know, that should help us to not fear, to not be anxious. So, but in this life, yeah, I understand we're all going to still fear. We're still all going to get anxious and have anxiety. Our goal is to have, as, as we're trying to go up in terms of holiness and blamelessness, our hope is to come down from this level of anxiety, you know, gradually come down a little. Um, as we consider, uh, our, the, again, the two foundations we've talked about for, for hope are God, his attributes, his perfections, and his plan of salvation and redemption, and the perfections of that, and all that's entailed in terms of the perfections of our inheritance, of our salvation, uh, of the richness of that. Um, as we grow in our understanding and belief in those things, our ability to fear not theoretically should lessen. Let's turn to Matthew 6.34. And you're probably going, why are you turning to the last verse of that chapter rather than early on? Well, you'll find out. I'm going to jump around, do, do some things a little bit unusual. The last verse of that chapter, 634, says, therefore, uh-oh, that points backwards. We have to go back anyway. But I still don't want you to hear the rest of it. You know, what? What? We'll, we'll see what brings us to this therefore. But what's the bottom line here? Just like Nancy gave us the bottom line of trusting God. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. What about today? Uh, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
So the command here from Jesus is don't worry about tomorrow. Just focus on today. Today has enough trouble, but we know from Lamentations 3, what? Yes. And yes, exactly. His mercies, his grace are new. And we, I like to expand it from every, mo every morning to every moment. Because God is with us at every moment and knows our trouble at that moment. And from one minute to another, our trouble might change. Um, and he is there to help us through that each of those troubles. And we should concentrate on today. Um, now, uh, so we, we need to understand that Jesus, as we talked about from Hebrews 4 last week, he went through every kind of trial and temptation that we do. And as a result, he has perfect empathy and sympathy for you in each circumstance in which you find yourself. And he successfully navigated each of those that he faced. And he is able through his spirit to help us to do the same, but we have to cast our cares upon him and look to him and trust him and listen to the leading of the spirit and have script be have immersed our, our minds and hearts with his word so that the spirit can bring the appropriate scripture to our remembrance to help us in that time of need. Um, but he's there to help us and is able to help us. He can successfully uh, help us to go through each one Jesus, the first paraclete, was with his disciples while he was there with them. He tried to help them to not worry, to not be anxious, like in the boat, uh, and successfully overcome and work through the trials and temptations that they had. We now have the other paraclete of equal importance and power as the first one, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us who can illumine our minds and our hearts and lead us and guide us and assist us to successfully overcome and work through all the trials and temptations that we experience. Now, turn, uh, look at verse 25. Therefore, oh boy, another therefore, well, just a second. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat or drink or what you will put on your bodies or wear. But we have, to, there's a therefore, we have to look back. Why, what is the therefore there for? And uh, we really have to go back to uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, and in, in this particular, uh, so turn, look at verse 9. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Again, our number one thought and goal should be for God's name to be hallowed, for him to be glorified. That should be above all else, since he is worth it and worthy of it. But he is our father that we can come to, and he listens. So we, as you think about everything else in this chapter, we have to go back to this. But number one goal, God's name be hallowed. That your, God's kingdom come, God's will be done, which includes everything that happens through us. All his providences with regard to us is helping to accomplish his goals, his purposes. And we should be wanting to uh, participate as cooperatively as possible in the accomplishment of all that. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know it's being done perfectly in heaven and imperfectly here, but again, the goal is to try to increasingly make it more perfectly done here in our lives. Give us today our what? Daily. Daily. Focus on today. So we see that here, and we see that at the end of this passage. Got to tie them together. Our daily bread. Now, what was the gr greatest example in all of history of God? Providing for his people. Manna. Manna. For how long? And what, what about their clothes and their sandals? 
They didn't wear out in 40 years. Think about that. Not having to go and get new sandals every year or so. They lasted 40 years. It's incomprehensible. Kind of like God's love. But God's love is even more incomprehensible than something lasting 40 years. I do have some shirts still that are probably 40 years old. Um, but um, just think about that. Daily bread, God provides. Pray, okay, God, provide for me today. And the next day, provide for me again today. Again, that should be our attitude. Day by day, one at a time. Uh, forgive us our debts. Again, the, the idea we need forgive, our need is great. Our, for, our need for forgiveness is great. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Again, you know, recognizing our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, that's, that Satan through his minions wants to attack us at our points of vulnerability. God, don't lead us into temptation. Protect me, put a hedge of protection around me. You are my rock, my refuge, my high tower, my defender, and deliver me from each, each one of these trials and temptations uh, to sin. And then he goes on and talks about treasures in heaven. And we're going to run out of time, as I was afraid we might. Um, verse 19. Uh, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And again, all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms are ours in Christ in heaven just like our lives are hidden with Christ in heaven now, our perfect, perfected lives. Uh, but store up here for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eyes are good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your, body, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So where are our riches? And again, some of the things that we that were mentioned uh, had to do with material things, whether it's our life and our health or our uh, jobs, uh, or our income, or our retirement, especially if it, you know, thou slumps 500 points in a day can cause people to be anxious, even causes some to commit suicide. Um, that's not where our treasure is supposed to be. Yeah, it's important, but it's not the most important thing. And that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves of. What is most important is our relationship to Christ and our inheritance in heaven, and our salvation. That's what's most important. And if that is our focus, we'll be a little less likely to fret, to be anxious, to have anxiety. Um, and uh, he talks about the eyes. And I'm, I'm just going to bring up my uh, illustration from last week again, very quickly. We were dead in sin. We were in complete darkness. We became Christians and the dimmer switch got turned a little bit and we saw some light, some, some degree of understanding of God's greatness and glory and the, and the beauty of the salvation. But, and we saw some of the, the, the worst pitfalls, but the subtler ones we didn't see. And as we grew as Christians, hopefully that dimmer switch keeps going up we see more of the beauty and more of the dangers, more of the obstacles, more of the deception, uh, but more of the beauty, the, the, the veins of gold, of silver, of uh, platinum, of diamonds. Um, and as that happens, you know, our eyes get full, fuller of light. That means the Holy Spirit is illumining our minds and our hearts more and yet more so that we have that bigger and bigger view of God. 
Um, and I need to stop because we're at time. Any questions or comments before I close in prayer? We'll have to come back to uh, Matthew 6 uh, on the 16th. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today. You're a God of God, Lord of Lords, and yet you have called us sinful human beings to be your beloved, adopted, royal children. Father, help us to remember how great you are. Help us to grow in our understanding of how great you are, how great our salvation is. And help us to more and more have you as being our treasure, realizing you are our only hope. You are our only real inheritance and heritage. Help us to fall more in love with you and say no to the sin, sinful temptations that are in the world, as well as the temptations, uh, the pressures to uh, discount or to, uh, to make more light uh, the doctrines of Scripture. Help us to hold firmly and help us to stand firmly. Uh, and help us not go down any slippery slopes individually, or as families, or as a church, as a denomination. Help us to remain steadfast and immovable in the truth. And help us to shine brightly for Christ. And we pray that you would be with us, uh, filling us with great hope, great joy, so that we're overflowing with gratitude and praise to you. Help us to go now and worship you, for you are so worthy. And may your name be be hallowed, and may you be glorified to the ends of the earth this day as your kingdom is extended and expanded as we await the return of Christ. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>